Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and those of you watching online as well. Good morning, good evening, uh, good day, wherever you are on the, on the planet watching these, these proceedings. My name is Gordon Flake, and I'm the CEO of the Perth U.S. Asia Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you all both in person, which is particularly delightful, uh, and online to the fifth annual Japan Symposium, this year focusing on a new era in Australia-Japan security relations. Before we formally begin the proceedings, it is my great honor to ask uh, Ms. Ingrid Cummings, a uh, Wajak Nunga woman from Fremantle, uh, as a graduate of Murdoch University with a, a degree from Melbourne Business School, who is now currently uh, working in community relations, community relations head for the city of Canning, uh, to uh, offer a, a formal welcome to country for this beautiful venue we're at here at the University of Western Australia uh, in, in, on the traditional lands of the Nunga Wajak people. Ingrid. Hi, I'm Mama Nyoga Yokolin Jamaya, and I'm Ingrid Cumming. I'm Wajak Nunga Yogi Yokolin Corporate Aware and Jenning Yanga Nunawa Jenjen Kunija Corporate Bujawa. Pretty good, eh? <laughs> um, on behalf of my ancestors and elders past, present, to the emerging leadership of the Wajak Nunga region, um, may I please acknowledge them and thank uh, you all for having me here representing about 38,000 Nyunga people uh, across this region to do the very significant uh, ceremony of Wanju Buja, or Welcome to Country. Um, here, at this very place where we're meeting today, um, is right next to a place called Brotandalup. And Brotandalup is the place of pelicans, but it's also known as the place where hearts come together, where a lot of marriage ceremonies or people from different regions coming together what an incredible uh, and an amazing place for you to have your gathering here today. So I certainly hope that you pick up on that energy of this is the place where hearts from many lands come together to do good things. So um, my welcomes are interactive. No one's a spectator. Right, you get to join in because my ancestors believe that it doesn't matter where you're from, what colour of skin that you have, even if you're an Eagles supporter. We will still love you. What a great weekend. I mean, two, right? Two wins for the Dockers on the weekend. Fantastic. Um, so we believe in good head, heart and spirit. We believe everybody should have the opportunity to connect to country. Um, and I'm going to give you that opportunity by Ma Baraning Ma. Has anyone done that before? Anyone Ma Baraning ma -ed? No? What if I said to clap your hands? Has anyone clapped their hands before? Definitely a lot if you're a Docker supporter on the weekend. So um, I'll get you to clap along the beat uh, and I'll sing uh, a very special song that comes from a place called Kalamara here in Perth. Kala meaning the fire and Maranda meaning place of ceremony. So when you're living in the southwest or visit the beautiful southwest of Western Australia, you actually speak a lot of Nunga a lot. So if I say Kalamara in an Aussie accent, Kalamanda, yeah? which is a suburb here in Perth. So um, that, this is where the song comes from. I'll get you to clap along with me. I'm going to sing for the ancestors to come and to look over all of us here to give us good blessing and good energy for us to go forward to have a wonderful gathering here today. And 50 bucks to anyone who can translate. Are you ready? <laughs> talent, right? And so do you. Like I said, we don't discriminate. I hope you felt that wonderful energy because when we do welcome the country, it truly is an opportunity to make you feel a sense of connection like we do here in this beautiful place, remembering it's going to take all of us to go forward together to achieve what we want to achieve in the future. So welcome to beautiful Wajak uh, Nyungar country on behalf of our families and our ancestors and I hope you have a wonderful gathering here with each other today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingrid. Um, 
we, we don't necessarily always associate policy conferences with energy and welcoming, uh, but if we could have half the energy and half that spirit of welcome that, that the Ingrid shared with us today, I think we'll have a very successful conversation. As I mentioned, this is the fifth uh, 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 Japan Symposium. Uh, this year, the title is focused on a new era in Australia-Japan security cooperation. Uh, it is something we've done in partnership with the consulate. Uh, I recognize the Consul General Suzuki here today. Uh, and this year, it was kind of a, a hybrid event. As I mentioned, we've got 100 people in the room, and it is so good to see your faces in person. Uh, but we've also got over 150 people watching online. So we welcome those of you who weren't able to be with us in person and joining us for this important discussion. But this is actually just the tail end of what has been a three-week process. Uh, my colleague H Haley Channer uh, is our senior policy fellow in Canberra. We call her our Canbassador. Uh, Haley flew out here for this event and over the last two weeks has moderated or uh, worked with us together to, to do a, a two different sessions, a deep dive look at Australia-Japan security cooperation in this region. And obviously, a lot of attention has been focused on submarines, has been focused on AUKUS, has been focused on the Quad. Uh, but as you, I think you'll hear today, there has been some tremendous advancement uh, in, in security cooperation between these very important countries, Australia and Japan. Um, we're honored to have with us today Major General Natasha Fox. Uh, we'll be talking later on in the program. Uh, in, in some respects, we are recognizing and celebrating the advancement of the reciprocal access agreement uh, between Australia and Japan and the military agreement. Uh, I see uh, former Ambassador Richard Court here. He was instrumental in, in the early stages of that, negotiating it in, in Canberra. I should also recognize former Defense Minister, former Foreign Minister, and a member of our board, Stephen Smith. Delighted to have Stephen with us as well. And of course, our special guest from Canberra, Ambassador Yamagami, uh, it, the keynote speaker kicking us off. And in just a minute, virtually, we'll be joined by J Ambassador Jan Adams, who's calling in from Tokyo. Uh, not quite yet able to entice her down from Tokyo. We're too close in terms of the borders, but we'll be able to get perspectives from both of our nation's capitals here in Perth, as you might imagine. I should also acknowledge uh, uh, that we have uh, Kate O'Shaughnessy here, the Australian ambassador to Mauritius. So I'm not quite sure what the plural is for a, a bevy of ambassadors, but we've, we, we, we certainly got that in the room today and online, we're delighted to have it. And we've also got a number of other key supporters. I, I look out the room, I probably should be mentioning each and every one of you in person, but let me acknowledge our very important corporate partners, uh, INPEX, we're delighted to have Bill Townsend and your other colleague from INPEX here with us. I should acknowledge the state government, uh, Simone Spencer, Deputy Director General of the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science, Innovation. Uh, JITSI is a very important partner of ours going forward. Uh, we've got uh, Patty Gregg uh, from Austell, uh, and very much appreciate their support. And given the importance of this relationship, uh, it is always important to recognize how fortunate we are to have such a vibrant Japanese business community in Western Australia, which largely built our resource sector and maintains it. And if you look into the future, you know, we recently from this stage have done programs on hydrogen and critical materials. Uh, they really are the future as well as the past in terms of our state economy. So to see Moroi san and to see uh, Nakao san here with us from Mitsui and in, in, in Mitsubishi, we're greatly honored to have you with us. Um, I've, I've probably gone on too long in terms of the introductions, but this is a really great opportunity for us as a community, whether you're in academia, whether you're in state government, whether you're in the business community, to reflect on Australia-Japan security relations. Now normally, in this venue, we wouldn't talk about security. That would be a Canberra thing, right? Uh, here we would just talk about energy and mining, right? Uh, but if you've noticed over the last 10 years, that has changed dramatically. Not only do we have Australia's largest shipbuilder and probably one of the most important ones, yeah, the only shipbuilder outside of the United States that actually builds for the United States Navy in Austell, uh, but we also have a defense industry in WA that is growing in importance. And on top of that, uh, the recent developments more broadly in the Quad and in AUKUS only highlight the growing importance of Western Australia. And so for us to be able to have a conversation uh, with leaders from Japan about that burgeoning relationship, I think is very appropriately centered here in Australia's Indian Ocean capital as we think about the kind of the future trends in this region. Uh, we're going to kick off our program uh, to make sure, and I want to make sure that we've got the, the video hookup right. We're good for the video hookup. Uh, with a, a virtual beam in uh, from Ambassador Jan Adams, who's uh, AO PSM. She's Australia's ambassador in, in Canberra, I'm sorry, in, in Tokyo right now. Uh, ambassador Adams has kindly spoken here in Perth to us before, uh, but we're really delighted to have her here with us virtually. 
Uh, she was previously Australia's ambassador to the People's Republic of China. So she's kind of seen both sides of many of the issues that we're working on today. Uh, prior to that, had served and in a long career as a senior member of our diplomatic corps uh, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as the Deputy Secretary over trade negotiations. Many of you will know that my colleague Jeff Wilson, who's our Director of Research, uh, is a real tradie. Uh, and if, 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 if you had trading cards, like baseball cards for, for, for trade negotiators, there would be one for Jan Adams. And so Jeff, I'm sure, would have that in his collection as well in terms of the process. So without further ado, allow me to turn over uh, virtually the podium to Ambassador Jan Adams for her welcoming remarks. Ambassador Adams. Gordon, thanks very much for such a generous uh, introduction. And Ingrid, uh, thank you so much for your most engaging welcome to country. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, uh, say thank you very much uh, for having me and uh, greet the many distinguished speakers and participants. Uh, let me particularly recognize a few people, uh, Ambassador Yamagami Shingo, Ambassador uh, of Japan to Australia, Major General Natasha Fox, Deputy Chief of Army, Richard Court, my distinguished predecessor as ambassador here, and uh, former Foreign Minister Stephen Smith. But uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the, the Perth US Asia Centre's Japan Symposium has become an important fixture looking at strategic and economic trends and how Japan and Australia can pursue our shared interests in the region. I look forward to what I'm sure will be a stimulating discussion this morning. It, it really is hard to imagine a time in history when the need for Australia-Japan security co cooperation was more pressing. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has violated international law and the UN Charter. The principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity are at stake. China-Russia cooperation is at an unprecedented high. Their no limits partnership has uh, very important implications for us all. China's military expansion continues rapidly. Its persistent militarization of the South China Sea is destabilizing and could provoke escalation. North Korea's missile tests and pursuit of weapons of mass destruction violate UNSC resolutions and po pose a grave risk to international peace and security. So against this backdrop, the significant advances in Australian-Japan bilateral defence and security relations are extremely important and uh, very necessary. The significance of Prime Ministers Morrison and Kishida signing the Reciprocal Access Agreement in January is hard to overstate. As Prime Minister Morrison has said, the treaty is a statement of our two nations' commitment to work together in meeting the shared strategic challenges we face and to contribute to a secure and stable Indo-Pacific. The RAA will underpin greater and more complex practical engagement between the ADF and the Japanese Self-Defence Forces. And uh, I'm sure we're going to see uh, much more advanced defence and security cooperation under that framework. So the priority now is the ratification of this important treaty. Uh, it's currently with Australia's uh, Joint Standing Committee on Treaties to commence our domestic process. And uh, we want to see both countries ratify this year. Uh, Australia and Japan's response to the volcanic eruption in Tonga showed uh, already the, the, the closeness that we already have in Australia-Japan defence relationship and our increasing ability to easily operate together. Uh, it, it actually also demonstrated the benefits of the RAA, even though it's not yet ratified, uh, as Australia arranged for Japan's self-defence force to base itself in Queensland as seamlessly as possible. And, uh, you know, only between Australia and Japan could it have happened in less than three days. While signing the RAA, our Prime Ministers also agreed to articulate our shared vision and ambition for our special strategic partnership in a new joint declaration on security cooperation. Now, work has already begun on this uh, revised declaration. Uh, we think it really is uh, a major imperative to update that founding document uh, last agreed in 2007. Now, uh, 
it's clear that there are major developments in policy taking place in Japan and in Australia, opportunities in fact that will need to be taken into account when we set out our bilateral vision in the declaration. We know the Quad, the importance of our trilateral defence cooperation with the United States and indeed our partnerships with Southeast Asia and ASEAN centrality will be vital to realising our bilateral vision. Australia also brings to the table our AUKUS defence partnership with the UK and the US, our investment in nuclear powered submarines and infrastructure and investments in cyber space, science and technology and increases in troop numbers. Meanwhile, in Japan, we're also seeing uh, shifts day by day. And in fact, it's headlined in today's, you can't see it, but even in today's Japan times, uh, uh, changes before our eyes in uh, security posture. Uh, I'd like to personally, and on behalf of Australian government, uh, commend Prime Minister Kishida and his cabinet for the speed with which they've responded to the needs of the Ukrainian armed force to provide non-lethal military equipment. We're also seeing Japan acting quickly and effectively on sanctions and export controls in response to Russia's aggression. Again, commend Prime Minister Kishida's leadership on this. Prime Minister Kishida has spoken about fundamentally strengthening defense and deterrence capabilities. And, and I quote, considering all possible options, including enemy base strike capabilities. Now this strike capability is something which uh, even very recently seemed a remote possibility, but now is actively under discussion. Uh, all of this comes in the context of Japan's work to update its national security strategy, defense policy guidelines and midterm defense plan. And now these, these foundational documents, uh, the, the review of these uh, policies has been brought forward uh, in recognition of the uh, deteriorating strategic environment. Now, it, it really is a chance for Japan to align more closely with US strategies and capabilities. But given the trajectory of Australia and Japan's defence commitments, the relationship with Australia may well also need to be significantly elevated in Japan's pillars of cooperation in its defence policy documents. Another area of uh, emerging cooperation concerns economic security. Uh, there have always been important economic dimensions to national security, of course. Uh, Globalisation and economic integration have, have only highlighted the friction points of where economics and national security intersect. Uh, over decades, countries like Australia and Japan have benefited enormously from the opening of the global economy. Uh, it, you, without it, uh, we would all literally be, be much the poorer. But increased openness uh, also means increasingly being exposed to external economic impacts and threats. And of course, the larger the economic partner, the larger the potential exposure. Uh, China's economic coercion over the last two years being a case in point, as uh, our ex exports of, of, of wine, barley, beef, lobster, coal, among some other products uh, have effectively been throttled. Now, these actions by China really serve to highlight the vital importance of our special strategic partnership with Japan, where we're so like-minded uh, on so many international economic issues. The risks of economic coercion and economic vulnerabilities today are real, potentially harmful, and I'm afraid not going away in the immediate term. So to address this, we're working with Japan and like-minded across a number of ways. We strengthen supply chains, uh, use the institutions that we have, be that OECD, WTO or elsewhere, uh, to highlight bad behavior and discipline where possible. Uh, we are working together, as always, to craft uh, better economic rules and norms through various uh, of the regional institutions. And we will continue to provide options for diversification to mitigate against those acting in bad faith. Building and upholding this international economic architecture, of, of course, 
strengthens our collective uh, economic security. It also builds on uh, the 1957 Australia-Japan Commerce Agreement. Uh, at that time, uh, what a powerful gesture of reconciliation and a visionary recognition of the two countries' deep economic complementarity. Uh, I, I know that with uh, Western Australia and some of our key, key Japanese investors there, I just note the long-term purchase contracts from the 1960s uh, that, that was so foundational, as, as was mentioned um, in the introduction before in generating resource industries in Japan and economic security, uh, uh, sorry, industries in Australia and economic security in Japan. This, this trust that uh, comes from that time continues to grow. I see it, uh, you, you know, also as a week by week proposition uh, as we uh, look at the new energy and resources partnerships that will be, well, actually are already emerging in hydrogen, ammonia and a range of other critical minerals and materials that uh, will be so crucial for the uh, climate, renewable energy technologies and uh, digital infrastructure for our future. In conclusion, uh, I want to leave you with uh, just a few, few simple thoughts about the opportunities for security relations between Australia and Japan. Uh, the future and trajectory of our cooperation uh, really now is, is embedded in the changing regional context, uh, in the imperative of economic security and the enduring fundamental partnership of our energy security, and including as we move to decarbonising our economies. So what better partnership than ours to pursue these interests uh, given the trust embedded in our relationships and our complementary economies. Uh, it truly is a, a, a remarkable special strategic partnership and I thank everybody there today for their interest and their contribution and I look forward to uh, the discussion this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Adams, for your comprehensive remarks and for kind of setting the stage for the conversations that will continue. Our next speaker is our distinguished guest uh, from Canberra, uh, Ambassador Yamagami Shingo. He really needs no introduction. This is his second uh, visit to this forum in, in Western Australia. He was appointed ambassador to Australia in December of 2020, so right in the middle of the pandemic. And despite that, his really made him, he's, he's been in every part of the country that has made him welcome, where he could actually get in, and probably a few beyond that as well. Uh, the, the current foreign minister of Japan, uh, Hayashi Yoshimasa, has been a friend of mine for some 30 odd years. I understand from him directly that, uh, that Ambassador Yamagami has been told to, to slow down a bit because the embassy is, is, is running really, really ragged and tired trying to keep up with him so much. Uh, he's really been dynamic. Uh, he had he's been in the foreign ministry since 1984. Uh, had distinguished diplomatic posts in, in Europe, in Asia, and throughout the United States, senior posts within uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Tokyo. Uh, but for our interests today, he also served as the, the acting uh, director general of the Japan Institute for National Affairs. And, and as someone who has a little bit of bias towards the, kind of the think tank policy community, perhaps that explains why Ambassador Yagami, Yamagami has been so visionary and so forward leaning. Uh, because anybody who's been in Canberra for the last year and a half will tell you, Ambassador Yamagami is pushing the envelope. He's making us think about some of the big picture issues uh, in the region. And so in that context, we couldn't ask for a better keynote speaker for this fifth Japan Symposium. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Yamagami Shingo. Good morning, and uh, thank you for your kind introduction, Gordon. And uh, if I were told by Tokyo to slow down, but Canberra is you know, telling me to keep up. <laughs> In that regard, you know, I take Canberra over Tokyo. <laughs> well, uh, High Excellency Ambassador John Adams, the Honorable Richard Cold, AC, Major General Natasha Fox, former Defense Minister Stephen Smith, 
uh, your excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure to be back here in Perth after such a prolonged break. Thank you for finally letting me in. <laughs> I tried on a number of occasions. <laughs> it is often said that absence makes the heart grow fonder, in which case I have high hopes for the success of this presentation. During my first visit last year, I remarked on the incredible natural beauty and the material wealth of Western Australia. And so when the opportunity came via an invitation from my friend Gordon, I moved heaven and earth to be able to enjoy such good company and breathtaking views out here in the West. Everything about WA is on the grand scale. The largest producer of gold in the world in September 2021, the largest world's largest iron ore mining center, a coastline of 12,895 kilometers, and a landmass greater than most nations. WA is always striving for greatness. Where else in the world would you find wines named after Plantagenet realms? And judging from weather reports, even Caratha is giving the sun a run for its money. WA has held a unique fascination for Japan, and that came long before our discovery of your lovable coconuts. From the earliest arrival of Japanese pearl divers to Broom, through to the major investment by Mitsui, Marbeni, Mitsubishi in WA iron ore during the 1960s right up to today, and the involvement of MIMI and IMPEX in LNG and soon to be explored green hydrogen exports, WA has drawn Japanese from Albany to Pilbara in search of material. This in turn has made WA a hot spot for Japanese visitors by reputation alone. Back in 2019, WA attracted a youthful bracket of Japanese tourists, most of whom were aged 20 to 34 years old. Moreover, two out of three of those visitors were on a return visit. You know that you are doing something right when you can attract that many young Japanese people to the pubs and clubs of North Bridge. <laughs> and thus forever changed the image of the Japanese as quiet and demure. <laughs> it is often pointed out that Japan and WA share the same time zone. And unlike the states out east, there is no fiddling around with daylight saving time, <laughs> which comes as a great relief. I did read that you had four referendums on daylight savings and the test run of it before removing it altogether in 2009. So at the very least, you are thorough in your examination of it itself a very Japanese trait. The fact that you face onto the Indian Ocean and that you are close in distance to the capitals of Asia than the cities out east continues to generate appeal in Japan as is one of your enduring strength. Indeed, your proximity to our mutual quad partner, India, is a major draw card for Japan as it allows us to work trilaterally with India on defense and national security. Furthermore, our continued mutual involvement in India, further developing its infrastructure while meeting its energy needs, and our advocacy for EORA assists in promoting India's regional role while simultaneously boosting its economy. 
the Indian Ocean is as much a key part of our security strategies as the Pacific. For decades, the shipping lanes of the Indian Ocean have provided Japan with myriad sources of sustainment and growth, and so their importance to us, as much to Australia, cannot be overstated. In recent years, however, we have witnessed the emergence of state actors who are not inclined to promote the vision of a free and open in the Pacific, and who take it upon themselves to act unilaterally to force change in violation of international law based on their own opaque reasoning. The challenges that this presents could not be allowed to go unanswered, and certainly not in a region as dynamic as the Indo-Pacific. It was in recognition of this that the four democracy of Japan, Australia, India, and the United States combined our shared Indo-Pacific goals to embark on the Quad. From its inception as a concept first promoted by Japan, the Quad has grown into one of the leading multilateral dialogues in this region. Its remit is vast and continues to grow, from vaccine distribution to critical and emerging technologies, strategies for mitigating and tackling climate change, and from outer space to cyberspace, the Quad works together to ensure that the nations of the Indo-Pacific benefit from the rule of law, economic prosperity, and peace and stability. Our shared mission has become even more vital in light of recent events. Last month, I had the privilege of accompanying Foreign Minister Hayashi during his visit to Melbourne to attend the Quad Foreign Minister's meeting, expertly hosted for the first time by Foreign Minister Murray Spain. Foreign Minister Hayashi himself remarked upon how timely the meeting was, given that in his words, the power of diplomacy is being called into question. The very fact that this, this meeting took place despite all of the obstacles presented by the COVID pandemic and competing parliamentary schedules speaks to the importance placed upon the Quad by its membership and how crucial its activities have become. As the Ambassador of Japan, I can also report that thanks to the kind consideration of our Australian host, the meeting took place on a public holiday in Japan, thereby allowing Foreign Minister Hayashi to attend. The Quad partners jointly declared our opposition to coercive economic policies and practices that run counter to the rules-based order, and we work collectively to foster global economic resilience against such actions. The four ministers have also welcomed the fact that the free and open in the Pacific vision has been resonating in various regions around the world including ASEAN, the EU, and other European partners. It was in recognition of this that a senior Australian official approached me during the foreign minister's meeting, heartily expressing the view that Australia now very clearly understands that it is not alone. It is not alone. These words alone brought a smile to my face as host of the Quad Leaders Summit in the first half of this year, Japan hopes we might have more reasons to work together as we move ahead. Furthermore, against the backdrop of the recent outrageous Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Quad Leaders convened a virtual meeting this month and confirmed that such an attempt to unilaterally challenge the status quo by force must not happen in this Indo-Pacific region. This is further proof of our commitment to regional stability and prosperity. I can assure you that Japan stands with Ukraine. As proof of our commitment, Japan made the unprecedented move of providing non-lethal equipment to Ukraine, including bread-proof vests, 
tents, helmets, generators, medicine, and so on. With Australia providing its own lethal and non-lethal aid to Ukraine, together we have shown that we will act in defense of sovereignty and territorial integrity against those who would seek to infringe it by force and intimidation. This brings me to the main theme of today's symposium, a new era in Japan-Australia security cooperation. That cooperation, which has been steadily building over the decade, reached a new high point with the signing of the Reciprocal Access Agreement in January this year. As a long-term advocate for the agreement, you can imagine my excitement as I was invited to join the Australian delegation for the virtual summit meeting that took place in Parliament House and where I witnessed the signing of the agreement by our two prime ministers. Here I was, an ambassador of Japan, joining Team Australia in an unprecedented gesture to mark a milestone in our bilateral security relationship and food significance in the words of Prime Minister Scott Morrison cannot be understated. So there was important symbolism there, given that this is the first such agreement that Japan has made with any country. But what it also showed is that Japan and Australia are resolutely committed to this special strategic partnership, which is far, far more than mere symbolism. What the RAA does is significantly increase both the quantity and quality of the bilateral exercises that Japan and Australia conduct together. With a legal framework in place, this allows us to conduct far more complex and sophisticated joint exercises using more equipment and with a broader scope of scenarios. This in turn will greatly increase our interoperability and complements our existing defense arrangements with a mutual ally, the United States. What all this means is that in the years ahead, the various arms of the SDF will be playing call, paying call to the bases, ports, and training grounds in Australia in greater number and with more hardware. I hope this will also mean more SDF uniforms will be seen around the streets of WA, maybe enjoying a bottle of little creatures. <laughs> Yet there is so much more on offer. Japan, like Australia, aims to become an independent space power, space power. And we are currently engaged in strengthening the scientific technical and industrial foundation of our space activities to improve our space situational awareness, or SSA. Yet to make the most of our technology, we need a partner. And what better partner could there be than Australia, and Western Australia in particular? As we lie on the same longitude, our satellite information can be shared in real time. This also makes it easier to monitor space activity as demonstrated by JAXA's use of the SSC space tracking station at Mingyanyu to monitor the Epsilon rocket number five last year. The defense technology sharing agreement that we have already allows us to cooperate on building capability in tandem. And I appreciate more development in this area as we move forward. This includes responding to the threat posed by ASAT, anti-satellite weaponry being developed by countries such as Russia and China. This is why Japan was so quick in vocally welcoming the formation of AUKUS. The adoption by Australia of nuclear submarines brings further areas of potential cooperation with the SDF into view, including joint exercises within the East China Sea or even Sea of Japan. Australia itself recognized the importance of this vital maritime area, a point re reinforced by the Defense Minister's speech to the National Press Club last year, in which 
Minister Bira Datum mentioned, the Senkaku Islands for the first time in the context of China's threat to Taiwan and the regional order. This comment certainly caught the attention of Tokyo and was very warmly received. With the security situation growing more severe in our region and more broadly across the world, like-minded countries will act in unison to mitigate potential threats by promoting deterrence. What the past two years have also taught us is that national security and the economy are one and the same. Japan's and Australia's experience of the COVID pandemic and economic coercion demonstrate conclusively that national security and the economy are inseparable and must be treated as such. We are under no illusion that the road ahead will be challenging. So together with allies and partners, we are doing all within our power to ensure that the rule of law remains a fundamental part of our regional order. So this is where Japan and Australia are at present, on the cusp of a more dynamic, robust security relationship reinforced by decades of steadily built cooperation. What would have seemed inconceivable to generations past has become a reality. Through the dedication and commitment of Japanese and Australians determined to see this security cooperation succeed. If my speeches over the past year can be said to have a theme, it is how far we have come together. The fact that we are here today talking about the new era in Japan-Australia security cooperation is a fitting testament to the hard work done by many in this room who have pulled out all the stops to move this security relationship forward. We've advanced with all the dynamism of a Dennis Liddy in Swinger, but there are still many overs to go. So before I try your patience with any further sports metaphors, <laughs> I will say that in Japan, Australia has a mate whose shared values and strategic interests will help ensure that the Indo-Pacific remains free and open. Together with our partners and allies, we are ready to kick this man out of the park. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Through much of my life, there was an operating assumption in public media, even in political discourse, that uh, Japanese government officials and Japanese diplomats spoke in very subtle, inscrutable terms. You can never really understand what they mean. Uh, but it is testament not only to Ambassador Yamagami that his remarks were so clear, so direct, uh, but also to how far the relationship has come. Uh, Ambassador Yamagami's remarks actually characterize the changing nature of the Japan-Australia relationship. Our final speaker, before we go to a panel discussion, uh, is the Deputy Chief of Army, uh, Major General Natasha Fox, uh, AMCSC. I think many of you will recognize how relevant it is, given the focus on security, that we have here, her here with us today. What you may not realize is that Major, Major General Fox is actually the very model uh, of the, the soldier scholar. Uh, she has deployed to Lebanon, to Syria, to Israel, was Chief of Staff of the Joint Task Force 663 in the Middle East. Uh, and on top of that, uh, she has three different master's degrees as a graduate of the Command and Staff College, the Defense and Strategic Studies course. She's gone a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore, the Wharton School, and the Said Business School of Oxford University. So it gives you a sense for the, the level of strategic thinking that we have in our defense force, uh, which has led to uh, the reciprocal access agreement and this traumatic development, dramatic development rather, of the Australia-Japan uh, de defense relationship. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Deputy Chief of Army, Major General Natasha Fox. Major General. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, thanks, Gordon, for those very kind words. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at this fifth annual Japan Symposium. I'm really quite privileged and honoured to do this when you consider the luminaries in this room. So Ambassador Yamagami, Ambassador Adams, former ambassadors, uh, current excellencies, uh, former defence ministers, business leaders, community members, thank you for this opportunity. I would also like to acknowledge the uh, Wajak Nanga people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and thank them for that really exceptional welcome today. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the leaders in this room who are employing veterans of our Australian Defence Force, supporting spouses and contributing to defence capability. Without you, we could not continue to serve and do what we do, so thank you. It's a great honour to be here speaking with you today and in terms of the ambassadors speaking and the panel that's been constructed, it actually does go to show the great depth of the relationship that we have with Japan. And Ambassador Yamagami and Ambassador Adams have mentioned that today. So I'll try not to repeat some of their outstanding words. But from a defence perspective, Japan is a key and valued defence partner in the Indo-Pacific. The growing complexity in our security environment that Ambassador Adams referred to compels us to continue to mature our regional partnerships and this is outlined in our Defence Strategic Update 2020. So it's in our policy uh, construct. In this context, our partnership with Japan has never been stronger and continues to grow and I'll outline some of the defence aspects of that shortly. We are committed to a very broad and very deep partnership with Japan. And as Ambassador Yamagami has mentioned, it is actually founded on our democratic values, our commitment to the rules-based global order, and our respective alliances with the United States. Changes in our region affect us all. And we recognise the value of partnerships to ensure our security to ensure our prosperity. Partnerships are a tangible demonstration of our shared interests and the level and depth of our engagement. Of course, Australia is committed to our established partnerships. ASEAN remains key. Our alliance with the United States remains one of our most important defence relationships, cemented with the focus on the Indo-Pacific. The recent AUKUS agreement complements our established multilateral and bilateral partnerships. ASEAN, our Pacific family, our Five Eyes partners, the Five Power Defence Arrangement and the diplomatic network of the Quad enable us to share our concerns, enable us to work cooperatively, collegiately on many issues supporting uh, us all. Open sea lanes, for trade, for investment, for infrastructure, for solving the humanitarian challenges that continue to arise in our region, and of course, climate change. Partnerships with like-minded countries contribute to our security and our prosperity, and that is why we invest in them. Now, with its growth in its prominence, but more importantly, in its ambition, our partnership with Japan grows stronger, both bilaterally and multilaterally, through our competition in, with one another, but also through our um, multilateral, multilateral partnerships that we have. As I've said, our, our partnership with Japan in particular has ambition. It is growing stronger. It is deep and enduring, bound by our values and interests, but grounded in our willingness to contribute to the region. It is open. It is inclusive in its character. More importantly, it is built on trust. Our nations have made immense progress uh, and it's this trust and depth of our relationship in the special strategic partnership where it is expressed today. We have worked side by side with our Japanese colleagues in the Japanese Self-Defence Forces. In Samoa, in Iraq, we have also cooperated on many United Nations operations together, 
in our peacekeeping missions in East Timor, in Cambodia and in South Sudan. Most significantly, in January this year, when Prime Ministers Morrison and Kashida signed the Reciprocal Access Agreement, it gave us more prominence and depth in that trust. We will leverage this agreement to enhance the scale and the complexity of our bilateral defence activities and increase, as Ambassador Yamagami said, the interoperability of our forces. The RAA was the first agreement in terms of regulating the status of visiting forces that Japan has signed since the 1960s. And this speaks to the strength and the mutual priority we place on this relationship, our long-standing friendship based on trust and respect and our shared intention to enhance that interoperability and mutual capabilities. Our two countries actually already have very many uh, bilateral, multilateral, large military exercise programs, and it's been growing at a significant pace. We have exercises right across the land, maritime and air domains, as well as trilateral and multilateral exercises with other defence partners. These exercises do improve our interoperability as they become more sophisticated over time. Some key advancements in particular last year included asset protection missions, amphibious landing activities from our LHD and progress towards air-to-air -to -air refuelling. These exercises are reinforced as Australia and Japan continue to work together through international disaster relief activities, as recently demonstrated and mentioned by Ambassador Adams in terms of how we support, supported Tonga together. We hosted Japanese self-defence forces aircraft and personnel at RAF Base Ambly worked with the Queensland Government to manage those COVID requirements, and we also integrated liaison officers into our Joint Operations Headquarters to coordinate the disaster relief efforts. We have also commenced personnel exchanges with uh, Japan, and for a first for Australia, we have actually, um, once this officer finishes a career course in Japan, will be posted to the Ground Component Command. This is a first for Australia. Japan also has people on our career courses. We also, for the first time, will have a Japanese officer posted into our first division headquarters, and this goes to the people-to-people -people exchanges and trust that we can integrate military personnel into one, another, one another's headquarters. The RAA establishes streamlined processes to support this arrangement. It supports the deployment of forces into one another's countries, and it makes it more quicker and more efficient to do so. It will cover practical elements such as dip clearances or diplomatic clearances, harbour and airport access charges, use of official uh, assets such as vehicles, entry exit arrangements of our forces, access to facilities, training, access to health and medical treatments, uh, and local purchases in and around support exercises of material support arrangements and equipment. And these are just a few areas that the RWA will actually have in a tangible sense to support our interoperable arrangements. The effect is actually increased practical engagement, increased and enhanced interoperability through more abilities to train together, to exercise together, to work together in one another's headquarters and units to support that interoperable arrangements. And this will continue to strengthen our strategic alignment. The next step that's already been mentioned is the domestic ratification of both of our countries, by both of our countries, of those of the RAA. And we are already in that process in government, with it being tabled at the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. Japan is also looking at it and working through that same arrangement. So in terms of the practicalities of the RAA, you cannot underestimate what it means for a military to be able to work closely with another military, to be posted into their headquarters, to be on training, to understand those arrangements so that when we need to do it in a disaster relief circumstance or in another security situation, they're already tried and tested. You cannot do that if you don't have that trust and you don't have that understanding. And that's what we have with Japan. We value greatly the ability for our defence cooperation and we look to the future, to the ambition of what the RAA offers us. With great optimism, 
uh, for what it will deliver. It is built on mutual trust. It is built on our shared values. And it is built to enable our people to continue to work together for the benefit of Japan, Australia, but more importantly, for the security and prosperity of our region, which affects us all. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. And it's been a great privilege, privilege and I really look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Major General Fox. As much as I was talking about uh, the, the stereotypical speech by a Japanese political leader or diplomat, uh, what you don't realize is you've seen something quite remarkable here today. Other than RAA, the Reciprocal Access Agreement, which was the focus of the remarks, we just heard an extremely clear and focused you know, 10, 15 minutes remarks without any acronyms, where we understood everything there. So it was remarkably well done, uh, uh, particularly uh, befitting the, the, the soldier-scholar nexus that I referred to at the very beginning. Thank you so much. We now have about 35 minutes to, to segue into a panel discussion. So if I could ask the panelists to please join me up here on the stage. Uh, in addition to our three speakers um, th that were here in the room with us, uh, we're going to be joined by former Premier and former Ambassador to Japan, Richard Court, who needs an introduction here, and again by my colleague, uh, Haley Channer, who's our, our Senior Policy Fellow in Canberra. Uh, this is Haley's first trip, at, trip to visit us and her colleagues in the office. Uh, since I think July when the, when the Prime Minister was here. So we're delighted to have Haley back with us again. So I'll kick off that conversation now, assuming the, the mic makes a transition. Look at that, seamless. Thank you to the folks at PAV, that's beautifully done. Um, again, we've only got about 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, I had more than any other program we've run in over eight years, I think I had a greater number and higher quality questions submitted by those who are watching online are those who pre-submitted questions from their, 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 um, re with their registration. So I want to start off with a couple of those to give you and the audience a chance to think. Then I've got two of my colleagues who will have microphones who I'll be able to come to get as many questions as I possibly can. Uh, since we've just heard from, uh, from, uh, from the Major General and from Ambassador Yamagami, I want to start with, with initially Haley and Richard with two questions, and I'll kind of open them up to the broader panel. And Haley, I want to start with, uh, with you. Uh, we had two questions, one from, from Bill Townsend. Bill uh, is here in the room with us, but submitted in advance. But it's the same question that was, was given by uh, Tanaka Nobuo, who's spoken virtually from the same stage before, former president of the International Energy Agency uh, in, in Tokyo. Uh, and they're both asking the question about the relationship between AUKUS, something you've written on and done a lot of thinking on, uh, and the RAA. So the broader question, I'll read it from, from Bill's things. What are the implications of AUKUS for Australia-Japan relations more broadly, and then if I could add it into the context of, of the Major General's remarks as well. So we'll start with you, Haley, if that's okay. Thank you very much, Gordon, and it's such a delight to be, to be here from Canberra. Um, I was very lucky in that I got to work on the Australia-Japan relationship while with the Department of Defence, and previous to that, I actually worked in the Defence Minister's office. Um, it was 2016, and at that time, we were looking at different submarines. In fact, I was in the Minister's office when the submarine decision came down and was very disappointed that it didn't end up going to Japan. Um, not just because um, of the diplomatic fallout with our fantastic partner in Japan, but also because it was a really missed opportunity to do something with a very close strategic partner. Now, cast forward and, you know, another six years and we're in a totally different situation with AUKUS. Um, and I think what we're seeing is a different uh, regional environment which has brought AUKUS into play. But it does open up opportunities for Australia-Japan relations. I don't think it's specifically on the submarine question. We've already been there with that. Um, but instead, um, AUKUS is not just about nuclear-powered submarines. Um, that was the big flashy headline. But in addition to that, there are so many other activities we will do under AUKUS for literally decades to come. So a couple of really important ones are the emerging technology ones, whether it's artificial intelligence, cyber cooperation, um, or undersea warfare, uh, and also quantum. And we will work more closely with Japan trilaterally with the United States and the UK. And we're also working with Japan on those technology issues under the Quad. And the final thing I'll say about that is what I find really fascinating about AUKUS from a Japan perspective is that Japan is not a member of the Five Eyes intelligence community. 
And that means that it's really cut out of a lot of really important intelligence discussions. AUKUS includes three partners of, you know, three of the five eyes, Australia, UK, United States. If there was an angle for Japan to get more involved, I see more angles for closer cooperation with Japan on those key technology issues, and I hope we could kind of rectify some of the diplomatic fallout that we caused in our previous submarine decision with Japan. So I want to open it up more broadly, but first I'd like to go to you, Richard. Obviously, this is something that you're familiar with as well from your... Yeah, look, thanks, Gordon. Uh, the beauty of AUKUS to me was that uh, you can now mention the words nuclear power and don't get shouted down. and. Uh, I think Australians, there was bipartisan support uh, for that decision that was made. And I think the reality is on the energy front, as we're wanting to move to, to lower carbon emissions, we're now going to have a more open debate uh, in relation to nuclear. But I just want to make an observation, Gordon, uh, which ties in with the negotiations for that reciprocal access agreement. We're now more than two years into this pandemic. And the downside of this pandemic has been we have not been able to travel. And um, we have not been able to, to travel freely overseas. And uh, for the first year, uh, we're able to live off Zoom conferences. And they work because we'd already built up that trust and respect and those personal relationships. But as the years have worn on, We've now got a major job ahead of us to refresh a lot of those personal relationships and to rebuild new relationships. Because what's happened over the last two years, a lot of uh, personnel changes have occurred. You know, governments have changed, uh, you know, ministers change in different countries, corporate leaders have changed. And, uh, and I'm very concerned that unless we move quickly now to refresh them, we're going to have uh, some problems. I'll tell you the importance of trust and respect. The critical negotiations for that RAA were done at, at the height of a pandemic. And at the time, you had Prime Minister uh, Morrison and Prime Minister Abe at the time. And there was a stalemate. These negotiations had been going on for years, and big bureaucracies on each side, and lawyers on each side. And uh, as you know, there was a few pretty critical sort of stumbling blocks. But it was the personal relationship between two prime ministers where they were able to have an incredibly frank discussion. And Ambassador Yamagami knows what was taking place. A very frank discussion. And which they basically then said to their respective teams, you lock yourself in a room and don't come out until it's all done. And when you have that trust and respect um, at that personal level, you are able to achieve these matters. And I know from my current corporate experience, um, we're finding that getting back to having face-to-face -face meetings is cutting through, things are happening much quicker. And I'll just add to that, if you look at current Prime Minister Kishida, uh, he was a long-serving foreign minister. He has terrific personal relationships with leaders right around the world. You know, he sits down with the foreign minister in India, Jai Shankar, and, it's just, and, and with Maurice Payne, it's just old friends coming together, talking. So we, I just don't want to underestimate the importance in the years ahead of us to refresh and rebuild those personal contacts, because at the end of the day, it's that, that's how the trust and respect can flow through to practical outcomes. Mm -hmm. All the more happy we are to have visitors from Canberra. <laughs> um, Ambassador Yamagami, uh, you were uh, in Canberra when, when the AUKUS agreement was announced. And as far as I know, Japan was the first non-AUKUS signatory country mm -hmm. to, to come out and, and have a statement of any type uh, in, uh, in re response to the, the deal, but very, very supportive. W would you kind of give us your insights as to what AUKUS means from a Japanese okay, perspective? Okay, yes. And before I touch upon that subject, go down low. Let me expand on what was explained by you know Richard, and uh, I think uh, you know this uh, signing of RAA owes a lot to the leadership by Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Mm. He kept on you know, pushing, pushing, pushing at every juncture, and without his wise leadership, we could not have come you know, this far. And also, I would like to highlight the importance you know, of efforts made by people like Richard. 
I clearly remember about uh, two years ago, uh, Richard came and visited Kaur and me at my humble cottage in Karizawa. It is not humble. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that you know, uh, one of the you know, uh, main subjects of our discussion at my cottage was how to proceed on these tough negotiations about RAA. But you know, Richard being Western Australia, I saw him at the you know, a bread train station. He was carrying uh, bottles of Western Australian wine. <laughs> and certainly it smoothened our time and we came up <laughs> with some brilliant ideas. <laughs> but yes, you know, this is a historic agreement, seriously. And uh, you know, talking about the relationship between this kind of a bilateral arrangement, RAA, or a trilateral arrangement, you know, AUKUS, or a quadrilateral arrangement, I believe you know, these multi-layered you know, arrangements, frameworks are very, very instrumental in terms of beefing up our security you know, efforts. And that brings me to your question of AUKUS. And yes, Japan was one of the first countries to express clear support uh, for the creation of AUKUS. Why? because we believe it is important to increase deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. The name of the game here is deterrence. We are witnessing a number of attempts by our you know, partners to challenge the status quo by force and intimidation in order to prevent such moves you know, from taking root and in order to preserve the rules-based international as well as the regional order, we need to come up with strong deterrence. In that regard, AUKUS is very, very instrumental. Well, thank you. Major General Fox, um, you did a wonderful job in explaining actually what RAA means and, and the implications of that. Could you step back and look at it from a slightly larger level in terms of how that might interrelate with uh, uh, the developments under AUKUS? I think um, as I was talking, I was uh, expressing what the ambassadors just referenced, and that is we have a layered approach to our bilateral, multilateral arrangements, uh, and that is really key from a defence perspective because it gives us a range of uh, different frames to operate in with different partners. And uh, as I mentioned, you need us um, able to operate in that frame when you need us to, and hopefully that does not actually happen, but um, these are arrangements and agreements and our partnerships are really key to enabling, um, from a practical perspective, the militaries to operate um, under the government's arrangements. So the bilats, multilats are really, really important in a framing sense. AUKUS is another arrangement for that to occur for us. Uh, it enables, as Hayley was saying, uh, work on our future's technologies not just nuclear submarines. There is um, much more to that framework that has potential. Our um, RAA with Japan and our partnership that we have in the trilateral sense with USA enables that to continue in that sense as well. So, um, which, and not putting words um, into the ambassadors, what he said, which is why Japan does also support us in that regional sense as well. Um, it's just another frame for us to continue working together strategically um, in how we pursue prosperity and security in our region, uh, how we work industry-wise to share technologies, but also then that translating to our defence operations and how we need to operate together. You know, it seems to me on a most simple level, it's, it's the question of the, the how versus the what, right? You, you can say big picture, we want to work together. You know, that's the what. You know, the how is the RAA, right? You know, the legal and, and, and logistical you know, foundation upon which uh, that, that collaboration continues. Thank you, very clear. Uh, I'd like to turn back to you, Richard, if I might, with kind of a WA specific question. Uh, Nicole Fasana is the Western Australia Trade Commissioner, Trade and Investment Commissioner in Northeast Asia, but based in Tokyo. Uh, and, and, and for our audience here in WA, uh, she asked the question, what are the implications of the FAA in particular for West Australia? Is there, is there, is there a, if you put your premier's hat back on, plus your ambassador's hat back on, plus our man in Tokyo's hat back on, hmm. can you, can you bo both, I would add, maybe expand that a little bit, both AUKUS uh, and the FAA, if we're looking at it as we are today here uh, in Perth, 
Uh, what are the implications for WA? Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, the representation that Western Australia now has in, in Japan is excellent, uh, working closely with, uh, with the embassy, and uh, it's long overdue. Um, we hear a lot about the Indo-Pacific region, and I think what we're starting to see now is a, a stronger recognition that the Indo side of it, the Indian Ocean side of it, is pretty important. And there's a strong, uh, already there's a you know, significant defence capability in Western Australia, but when you look at the resource wealth that comes out of here and the importance of those supply chains of uh, commodities uh, into, into countries like Japan and, and Korea, um, I think we're going to have to see a, an even stronger focus on building the defence capabilities on this side of the country. And particularly up the top in the, in the north, I mean, from the, you look at the huge investments in the Pilbara, both in minerals and in energy, but increasingly in the Kimberley region, which is very remote. Uh, I was watching that uh, rescue operation the other day of the Indian fishermen in the Ashmore Reef, and it makes you realise the huge distances involved. I mean, it's pretty hard getting choppers out to Impex's operations, yet alone to, to be you know, carrying out defence operations out in, in that Indian Ocean. So I think what we're going to see, uh, and this is one of the beauties of the Quad, we're now starting to see more cooperation with India, uh, and India is expanding its sort of reach uh, closer to, to uh, Southeast Asia, and I think those developments are important. But from an Australian perspective, I think there's more that we need to do here. Uh, Australian, Western Australian industry, uh, I think we'll be able to benefit from the, I mean, what a very significant expenditures, you know, government expenditures, um, you know, two percent of our GDP is a pretty, it's a lot of money, and uh, I think it's important that we build up those capabilities. And finally, it's interesting because of the long distances involved in Western Australia, we are used to pioneering and innovating to handle, uh, you know communications across long distances, but also in, 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 in airlines. I mean, what's not understood is the first commercial air route in Australia was in Western Australia. Uh, interestingly, between Geraldton and Derby. Um, and the reason it was between Geraldton and not Perth is that the railways had a monopoly up to Geraldton, so that's pre-regulation. But I think we're going to see a lot of developments in communications, um, on the space side of things, which interestingly our resource sector is right into, you know, because they become leaders in running operations autonomously. Um, so it's all, all good news. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to kind of address kind of the big topic of the day. I, for almost five years, every single event we ran at the Perth US Asia Center inevitably would turn to a certain very colorful US politician. And the last six months has been relatively quiet in that front. But today, we really can't have a conversation, even if it is about Japan, uh, Australia's security cooperation, without talking about the events in Ukraine. Uh, they've dominated international attention in many of the questions we got. Uh, we had a, pr a question from Professor Tadashi Kimiya, who's watching from the University of Tokyo. We're delighted to have those of you in Japan watching this, this discussion as well. Uh, and like so many of the other questions, they wanted to know the implications of what's happening in Ukraine today for Australia-Japan security cooperation. We got a very clear indication from Ambassador Yamagami's remarks. I might want to start off with some other reactions to that as well, because you, you've addressed it in your speech. Hayden, maybe we'll start with you, and then I'll come back to, to, to the other members of the panel to see what you think about how this changing international context. But again, if I could preamble this just a little bit, um, it, we're less than a month into this crisis right now. And yet, uh, the, the consensus is there was more change in European security strategy over the course of a weekend than there had been in the previous 50 years, right? Uh, and the question is, does that pace of change then have a lag time and get reflected in this region as well? So, Haley, we'll start with you. Yeah, I was really shocked, like everyone else, naturally, about the events in Ukraine. It seemed to just happen overnight in the blink of an eye. And you just can't turn the news on today without seeing really bad news. If it's not the pandemic um, or horrific scenes from Afghanistan and the withdrawal of US troops there, it's a war in Europe. 
Um, and I think, you know, if things bad news comes in threes, hopefully we've really put that aside now and we can start to focus on what good things will come for us in the future. But Ukraine has done a number of things for our Indo-Pacific region. Really, it's scared and shocked us into a new um, realisation that the era of conventional wars is over. And we are now facing a, a much darker, frankly, um, future position. And I know that Japan has had um, a trajectory of increasing its defence spending and also increasing its con contribution to regional peace and security uh, since after the Second World War. But it has taken a very long time to get Japan to where it is today um, because of Japan's pacifist constitution. And if Ukraine has done anything, it has really um, scared uh, the Japanese government and Japanese public into realising how visceral and real um, war can be. And for the Australian, Japanese, US context, there's a lot of discussion over Taiwan. And could this situation, the same situation, play out here in our region and how horrific and scary would that be? And in a sense, that has really catalyzed all of us into much quicker action. We need to work together to do more, more quickly things. Um, what I think is also important to note is that if you look at Japan's territory, it has an island, its westernmost island, um, is only about 100 kilometers from Taiwan. Now, if you put that in context here in Perth, it's the same distance from Perth to York, or as my research director jokes, it's still Perth and 100 kilometres. Um, but that is such a short distance that if there was any kind of contingency on um, the island of Taiwan, Japan would be probably immediately involved. And in fact, changes to Japan's self-defence force law now basically necessitates that the United States and Japanese forces both would be drawn into a war in Taiwan. Now, what does that mean for Australia and Australia's contribution? As you know, horrible as it is to think about that kind of future, unfortunately, that is where we are now. We can't just hide under a rock and believe that conventional wars are a thing of the past now that there are other things like grey zone warfare. Um, Ukraine has really reminded us that um, hot wars can still happen and it will be very important now for Australia to work much more closely with Japan, not just under the RAA, but in every aspect of our relationship with Japan so that we have a partner that can help us with trade coercion, um, that can help us with you know, non-traditional security challenges like climate change and how that's putting other countries in our region under pressure. So really, while the Ukraine crisis has been a terrible occurrence, it is a catalyst for closer cooperation between our two countries. Major General Fox, I, I do recognize this is a sensitive area for public commentary, but it's been pretty clear from your remarks in the panel that the RAA is a remarkable achievement, but it took a long time. Uh, and it took political leadership, and it took like, some dedicated work. Um, if you look ahead, are there areas where we should hope for an acceleration in Japan, Australia, security cooperation, based on kind of the trends uh, uh, that we see in Ukraine, et cetera? So uh, the Ukraine war showed us that sovereignty matters. The Ukraine war showed us that things can change extraordinarily quickly, that there is no substantial warning time in order to prepare to protect sovereignty. So from my perspective, the RAA is quite timely for us because it enables us to have that um, framework that supports our operations now. So that's why it's so critical. Well, thank you. We, we were fortunate in August of 2020, then Defence Minister Linda Reynolds publicly launched the 2020 Defence Strategy Update from this stage. Uh, and one of the underlying kind of a, um, conclusions of that update was that the strategic warning, warning time has evaporated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think you're exactly right. We've seen that driven, driven home uh, very clearly in the last month. Uh, Richard, over yeah, to you. Yeah, Gordon, just a comment in relation to energy security. Um, we've all seen the reaction of Germany. You know, it, it's found itself in a very difficult situation where it's, it's wound down coal, it's wound down nuclear, and an increasing dependence on Russian gas. And sort of overnight, uh, it realises it's got itself into a, a difficult position. It's interesting when you look at Japan's sort of energy mix. Um, Japan 
diversifies where it gets its energy from. And um, it gets LNG from a number of different countries, uh, including Russia. It, it's got the Sucklin fields uh, next door to it, uh, which is logical for them, it's a neighbour. Uh, but it's also got the uh, Arctic LNG coming uh, around the top, those two new developments there. But because it has diversified its sources, um, countries like Australia will be able to step up and, and help sort of fill any shortfalls. But I think from a position of energy security, uh, Australia, like many countries, we're moving to sort of, we want to lower our carbon emissions but in the process of doing that, we've also got to make sure that we uh, ensure that we have uh, our energy security as well. So I think that's one of the lessons that's, that's come out of it. The other interesting thing is um, the supplies of fertilisers and the like coming out of both Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I think we need to become more self-sufficient in producing um, uh, more of our own fertilisers that we are using for our agricultural sectors and I declare a vested interest uh, I'm involved in building a new fertiliser project. <laughs> well, if I may, you know, uh, my personal take, you know, as a student of, you know, international relations and diplomatic history is, you know, uh, at the end of Cold War, we are talking about the end of history. Uh, my take is, you know, uh, looking at uh, you know, what's been transpiring in Ukraine, I think uh, we would be able to say post-Cold War ambiguities are clearly behind us. It's not that we didn't do our best. G7 was expanded to G8 at one time. You know, entry into WTO you know, was granted. But that said, after all these years, we are now clearly seeing who are standing on the other side of the river from us, blatantly challenging the rules-based international order. This brings us to the need for us to join forces in order to protect the rule of law between countries like Australia and Japan. And as Richard rightly pointed out, the stable supply of energy is also important in order to surmount you know, these hurdles. So there is a lot Australia and Japan can do together. Fantastic. We've got about 10 minutes left. I, I've got two colleagues who have microphones, which are, will be wiped down hygienically between each question if we want. Uh, I'm going to ask you to ask short, pithy questions. Just brief it. And if it, we'll start with uh, former Defense Minister Stephen Smith. We've got a microphone coming to you right there, real quick. Uh, until the panel started, there wasn't much mention of the trilateral relationship that Australia and Japan have with the United States. We're both allies of the United States, and for some time we've had a ministerial level foreign minister's trilateral process, and more recently a defence minister's uh, level trilateral process. It seems to me two things. Firstly, that the obvious place to go to pick up all of the new technology uh, prospects that we find mentioned in AUKUS is our own trilateral with the United States. That's first point. Second point, our focus has been security, but you can't have security without prosperity. Uh, and one of the things which has been vital to both of us has essentially been the presence of the United States in the Indo-Pacific. One of the weaknesses in terms of that US presence is we still do not have a comprehensive US economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific, courtesy of their lack of presence in the TPP. And so the Biden administration has made it clear that it's not proposing to join the TPP, so we have the, the, the perversity that India is not in APEC or RCEP and the United States is not in the TPP. Maybe it's time that we start to think about US economic engagement being as important as our security engagement. And perhaps one vehicle of doing that is for Australia and Japan to suggest to the United States that it's time we had a ministerial level trilateral meeting on the economic front, which included our treasurers or finance ministers as other country calls them, and our trade ministers to start to encourage the United States to genuinely and deeply economically integrate into the architecture of our region. Fantastic. Professor Smith, uh, 
has given voice to two of the questions that came online that I really wanted to get to. Tom Corbin from our sister center at the University of Sydney is watching online and asked specifically about that trilateral Australia, Japan, US relationship, uh, whether it should be reinvigorated in this context. Uh, and then uh, Glenn Fukushima, who's watching from Washington, DC, you know, again, focus the, the, uh, the economic aspects of security. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll start with you, Ambassador Yamagami. Can I give you a reaction to those? I think that's a very good point, you know, made by, you know, Mr. Stephen Smith. And I couldn't agree more with, uh, you know, tenet of uh, uh, his argument. Uh, on a lighter note, you know, the other day I went to this, you know, Toyota factory in uh, uh, Altona, Melbourne. And I asked them, you know, uh, where are those Toyota cars running in the streets of Australia produced? Some are produced in Japan, others are produced in Thailand, and others are produced even in the United States. But in terms of covering, you know, the supply chain of Toyota cars to be marketed in Australia, you know, US, Australia, or Thailand, you know, Australia, you know, we are yet to extend the network of CPTPP. So this is one of those examples. If only we have a sort of, you know, comprehensive framework to cover trade and investment throughout in the Pacific, this would very much help business activities as well as and strategic meaning too, very important. So yes, you know, we should join forces together to bring United States, you know, back to you know CPTPP, it's not that you know US is not interested in this endeavor. You know they are coming up with you know ideas of economic framework, you know, throughout the Indo-Pacific, but uh, nothing is going to alter it. You know, uh, to be nothing is going to be an alternative for this important strategic framework of CPTPP, and both Australia and Japan can be proud of the past achievement, but yet there is a lot, you know, we can do together. I'm going to try to squeeze in another question. Do we have any more questions from the audience? You ready? Yes. Up, up here. Ambassador O'Shaughnessy. And it's coming around here. Thanks very much, um, all of you, in fact, for fascinating presentations. I had a question for a question and a comment for Ambassador Yamagami. I was really struck by the power of your messaging on the Indo-Pacific and the importance of stability there, and its resonance with the absolutely in lockstep messaging of your counterpart in Mauritius. And I, I really want to commend Japan for the unity of purpose in that consistent messaging. I think that's a very powerful force in the region. I was interested in your perspectives on how, how unified can we get the region to be on having unified public messaging on the importance of that stability. We have players in the region that are more comfortable with talking about that than others. So uh, any insights you have on the importance of, of building a unity of mm -hmm. purpose in public messaging mm -hmm. would be really interesting to hear. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, for the excellent point, Ambassador. And, uh, well, I'd like to just share my personal thought with you on, on two points. One, I don't know, this important concept of free and open in the Pacific. I think this is public good. You know, any country can join you know, this important concept. And in order to entice our friends in Southeast Asia or Pacific Island countries or throughout in the Pacific region as a whole, uh, we need to keep on coming with you know, tangible, tangible benefits. In that regard, we are working hard on such issues as vaccine distribution or improving quality you know, infrastructure. And the second point I'd like to mention here is the way we address you know, the challenges you know, facing these countries. You know, it should not come from the attitude of lecturing or you know teaching it should come from the perspective of extending helping friends as equal partners i think equal partnership is a key word throughout you know japanese history you know we learned bitter lessons during second world, world war time or even during 1970s you know unless you are careful you know, you will face tremendous, you know, 
resistance or reluctance you know, on their part and looking at how authoritarian regimes are behaving throughout the region, you know, we, sh we shouldn't lower ourselves you know, to that standard and we should come up with more sophisticated and more passionate you know, approach. And w there, I think Australia and Japan can share our experiences and come up with a better approach. I realize there are many more questions in the audience, and I have two pages of questions I'd love to get to, and I can't tell you how much I want this conversation to continue. However, this is a Japan symposium, uh, and since our partner in this endeavor is a country that gives an apology when a train is 30 seconds late. <laughs> if I don't keep it in time, then I'm in trouble uh, in the process. But it really is wonderful for us to have uh, Ambassador Jam Adams joining us virtually, to have Ambassador Yamagami making his trip in. We're so delighted to have you back. Uh, to have our local team here with, uh, with uh, the, uh, Ambassador Court and, and Professor Smith. Uh, and really the strong support of, of the Defense Force, to have the Deputy uh, Chief of Army join us. It really gives you an indication of how quickly this relationship is developing, how important it is. So on behalf of the Perth US Asia Center, let me first ex express my thanks to all of our speakers, our panelists. Uh, let me express my thanks to my amazing team. For the last two weeks, uh, we have actually not been in the office because we wanted continuity of programming. If we all met in a conference room together, we couldn't be here today. Uh, I want to express my thanks to my colleague Haley, who kind of led this Japan uh, symposium endeavor. We're delighted to have her here with Tokyo. And most importantly, thank you to all of you. Uh, we look forward to, to reconvening again for our sixth Japan Symposium next year. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.